Good evening. Welcome. My name is Ted Kasek. I'm a faculty member here, and uh, it's my privilege to coordinate the 2015-16 Building Ecology Science and Technology Lecture Series. Um, I, I'm having a hard time coming to grips with the fact that it's the last best lecture of the, uh, of, of the season, but uh, in keeping with our seven years of past traditions, we, we have saved our, our best for last, or, or, or certainly not our worst for last. So that's, that's good news for everybody here, I hope, I'm sure. <laughs> Before we uh, continue with tonight's lecture, I'd like to call upon Sean McCallum of Tremco to personally welcome everyone. Sean? Thanks very much, Ted. Great to see everyone. Um, just to allude to what Ted said, it is hard to believe that this is the last lecture uh, of the season, which means that it's spring, which means that it's roofing season, which is great when you work for a company called Tremco Roofing and Building Maintenance. So uh, you guys know us. We're here uh, every lecture, and uh, we've been doing this for the past seven years. We're honored to be a part of it. Um, because it is roofing season, if anyone would like to learn about uh, how to put down a roof that literally never needs to be replaced, can just be restored over and over, last the life of the building, come on up and talk to me at the bar. That's where I'm most comfortable. So thanks again for uh, having us out. And uh, like I said, we're honored to be a part of this. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. I know all about the roofing, but I'll still join you at the bar. I'll try not to hog you. I'll, I'll leave you for the others. Well, anyway, um, I have to always say this because it's important. Some of you, it may be your first time here. And if you want to obtain continuing education credits, then we ask you to fill out one of the coupons. And we promise that before the school year is out, you will get your certificates. Unfortunately, this is the crunch. Like, for all of you that went through architecture school or design school, you all know that there's this magic day on the calendar. It's called St. Patrick's Day. And then from St. Patrick's Day onward, you can't expect students to do anything other than their schoolwork. That's just the way it goes. And, that, and then finally, we get our students back and we can get certificates processed. So they will get to you, but you just have to be patient. And think of how hard all those students are working, and that'll be some relief. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker for this evening's lecture. Uh, Victoria Taylor is a, a graduate of the University of Toronto's uh, Landscape Architecture Program and, and uh, an example of, of what I like to call landscape activism and advocacy, which is good, because we need that in a city like Toronto. Uh, landscape architecture is always being engaged, uh, I guess, in its broadest sense here at U of T, but also in particular within the context of the urban landscape. Uh, notions of landscape architecture are now moving towards landscape as infrastructure to reconnect us uh, with the roots of our natural landscapes. Uh, Victoria Taylor represents a new generation of landscape architects who are beginning to connect the dots between landscape, ecology, infrastructure, and culture to reveal relationships that will guide more sustainable development of our cities in the 21st century, making them healthier, livable, and more beautiful than ever. With just a little more faith on our parts and a willingness to move over and let the next generation fashion their world, we could learn to make our urban landscapes work better so that we may enjoy them more. Tonight, we will see some of the ways forward. Please join me in welcoming Victoria Taylor as our speaker for tonight's best lecture. Thank you. Um, thanks everyone for coming tonight. If, if uh, when you were gathering earlier, you saw a video um, showing on the screen, and I just thought with spring coming, and uh, I thought I'd show that work, and also as an example of how I like to integrate different creative practices into into my practice as a as a landscape architect to tell different stories about about landscape. So that was called emergent structures, and that was where's my thing. That was um, an installation in a small window a gallery on Queen Street West um, called Emergent Structures. And uh, it, it showed just before spring, so I wanted to do something photographic. And so I, um, and it's just by Trinity Bellwoods Park, just down the street. And so I went to the park and I photographed um, just as the buds were emerging in all the trees in Trinity Bellwoods Park over six weeks just before through spring. 
And, uh, and then along with my partner, Linda Dervishe, um, we put, this, put that together into a video to kind of a juxtaposition between the, you know, the cupcake eaters and boutique shoppers on Queen Street West and then this beautiful park public space that was just down the street nearby. Um, <clears throat> so good evening and thank you so much Ted and Tremco for inviting me and uh, Ted's been really generous with his time advising me on a project um, about punctures in laneways and I guess that's why he invited me here tonight. Um, so first of all I wanted to start with some early inspirations for my work and uh, talk a little bit about um, ideas that inform my practice as a landscape architect and as a public art curator here in Toronto. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to use my notes a bit. Um, so my work is about provoking and stimulating, encouraging new ideas in landscape and uh, blurring disciplinary boundaries, um, trying to bring new meaning to the profession of landscape architecture and to affect ecological and cultural change. So my path um, draws on lots of influences, being in wild spaces, love um, gardens and plants and growing food and art and travel and talking about um, how to make uh, our outdoor spaces um, better places to be. So uh, I started off at McGill in science and then um, that lasted for like a semester. And then uh, I moved into the commerce department actually at McGill and in marketing. And we learned about selling uh, products. But my interests um, evolved into the selling of ideas and being more concerned about the world around us and ecological degradation and uh, you know the three R's were just coming out and uh, so um, I finished in marketing at McGill and joined Greenpeace and I was uh, protesting and writing their um, consumer product um, brochures that would help to change consumer habits around purchasing and uh, walking more lightly on the planet. I think that was the slogan back then. And uh, so while I was working at Greenpeace, I wanted to take my academic studies a little bit further. And so I entered York's uh, Master of Environmental Studies program. And there I met Michael Huff. And uh, at the time, I had no clue about what a career it was in landscape architecture, but I really loved um, getting out of the classroom and he took us into the Don River system and we studied the river and the site that's now um, basically the Evergreen Brickworks and his vision in this book, and which has now actually happened a lot today in that ravine system. Uh, so it was really wonderful to, to have that experience with, with him. Um, and around this time, I uh, was really obsessive about gardening. I just started getting into plants, having my own garden, which this is not my own garden. Um, <laughs> and uh, just like reading all the nursery tags, uh, going, spending time at Humber Nurseries, and um, um, just really being obsessive about moving plants around. And I uh, joined my sister and my mother on a trip to England, and we visited this is Great Dixter, one of the famous gardens uh, outside of London, and Sissinghurst, and went to the Chelsea Garden Show. And I just love being around people that um, talked about plants uh, in their botanical, like they threw around botanical names, like they just um, was part of their language. And it was also part of their culture, like horticulture and garden design was just part of the culture of, of England. And I really love that, but I wanted to um, see how those, the ideas about beauty and gardens could connect with my um, interests in uh, cities and, and, and spaces in cities. And, uh, so I, um, what was I? I, I worked on my own garden. This is a um, garden in Toronto that I designed. And I started my own um, residential garden design business. Um, building up a residential cl clientele here. And uh, um, but then I needed some more training, credibility, and that's when I ended up here at ALND. And coming to the topic of tonight's talk, uh, landscape puncture, uh, first started at a, with an option studio I took in my last year with Chris Fannin, who worked at Dirt Studio, who's a, a company 
out of um, Virginia, I think, and um, being really inspired by this project in particular, um, the headquarters of Urban Outfitters, where they just um, took, the, took the, the asphalt around the building, broke it up, and then reused it in the planting of the of the garden around the building, and I just thought that was a really cool idea. And also what was um, cool is that this option studio was going to Vegas. So uh, I'd never been there, and it was a place I always wanted to go to. And uh, this, was, this is the landscape of Vegas um, that drew everybody there. C Chris with Dirt Studio was um, doing a lot of work around the shifting of land use along the strip. Um, the changing from it being a very migratory uh, tourist destination to it being um, more of a condo development, and a lot of the ho all hotels were being imploded. And uh, he chose for us, oh, there's what the real landscape looks like around Vegas. Uh, so I was inspired by the juxtaposition between this and this. And then this um, was our studio site. Uh, it's a 40-acre parking lot just behind the Vegas Strip. And I don't know, I don't really have a laser, but the Strip is just right off to the, to the right. So it's incredible that this very active linear zone of, you know, kids giving out porn tickets and people drinking cocktails in architectural landmarks um, in the shape of glasses like the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> and it was really all happening. And then here's this pretty much vacant parking lot the whole time we were there. Uh, so there was that narrative that I was playing around with and also um, about the desert ecology and how Vegas was this totally unsustainable, shipping water in from great distances and shipping in plants from so far away to create um, a very fake landscape that was the spectacle of the strip. But I wanted to talk about how we could change that ecology on this, in this vacant lot. So um, Chris, the studio director, he, was, um, he, he asked that we bring in a, a contemporary artist and a product from the waste stream to inspire our, our project. Uh, the artist I chose was Olafur Eliasson, that probably most of you know here, and his, his ideas, his way of seeing the world really inspired me. And then the product I chose, um, was PVC pipe. And uh, I loved the idea of taking this, kind of, this, this object and physically breaking through the surface of uh, this parking lot. And so that was um, the idea for the site. You know, obviously inspired by Dirt Studio and um, how we could break up the site, still keeping it functional as a parking lot and then opening up these um, incisions to be vessels for stormwater um, percolation and uh, vessels to collect seed and um, soil. And the migratory, the voluntary seed from the desert was what I imagined would um, colonize into these incisions in the parking lot. This is all hypothetical. Um, so just some sketches from my, my project <laughs> in school. Um, so what, you know, what to, where to go from there? Graduated from school, worked at um, a lot of really great firms here in Toronto, and, um, and then um, testing different studio scenarios and different projects, but I knew I wanted to um, start my own practice again um, as a landscape architect, and I finished my licensing and uh, an, opportunity, uh, an opportunity came, um, and I was invited to propose a large-scale piece for Canada Blooms, uh, which is, um, I think, going on right now. It's a big interior horticulture garden design show here in Toronto. And uh, the piece um, had to be five feet wide by 200 feet long, right through the middle of the uh, show's con the convention center. And it had to um, come under the theme of urban culture. So I was like, OK, perfect. Quit my job. I'm going. <laughs> and uh, so I proposed concrete bloom bursts and as my manifesto of um, changing the ecology on a vacant lot, um, 
bringing in um, also so the the garden that I envision the garden I envisioned for Canada Blooms, which is basically a, show, a room full of force bulbs and force magnolias and rhododendrons. And I wanted to do something completely opposite uh, aesthetically to that. So bringing in um, shards of uh, rubble from the buildings and roads that were being um, torn up in Toronto. Um, twisted rebar. Um, I wanted all this material brought to Canada Blooms and I created my garden out of this. So similar to how Leslie Spit has been uh, created. Uh, it's not new. Um, but I wanted to see how it could work in, a, in an interior garden show setting and, and stimulate the conversation. Um, <clears throat> and also just use the metaphor of this for um, the energy of, cities, of a city's culture in the same way that a plant grows through a crack in the, in the concrete. Uh, so this is my image that I used um, for my proposal. And then here's just a few images of the installation starting to come together at Canada Blooms. And this is uh, 2012, I think. And uh, they, they, you can see the stanchions, um, the red rope around. They made us um, put in this whole perimeter of <laughs> stanchions <laughs> so that uh, no one would touch it. Um, but that, that was really fun. And, um, and it got me thinking more about spontaneous vegetation and uh, vacant lots. And of course, this is not new. Um, Leonard Cohen sings about it. Um, this is his song, Anthem, that lots of people know. And also artists always, uh, many, many artists have been inspired by activating an incision in the landscape. Um, you can think of Michael Heiser on the left is, um, Richard Serra's shift piece here in King City, just outside of Toronto. And then um, this piece by a local artist, Corwin Lund, who activated um, a very narrow laneway in Queen Street West. It was just a gorilla installation um, that lots of people would come by and swing um, in this alley. And then books that, I, that inspire me and people who've been writing about spontaneous vegetation. Um, in the middle there, um, the Spontaneous Urban Plant Project by Future Studio in Brooklyn. Um, they're doing a big project actually right, right now. Um, and then Peter Del Tradici, who is um, a lecturer, I think still at GSD. And his idea is that why would we plant native plants in a place that is no, has no native soil, nothing's native about it. We've reconstructed the whole of our cities, so why wouldn't we look to the plants that actually just grow there on their own and are hardy and can deal with low nutrient soils? And um, <clears throat> why don't we look to that as a, as a palette for our urban landscapes? Uh, so, so what next? Um, so I was invited to um, in, um, enter into an ideas exhibition. Um, it was hosted by the David Suzuki's Foundation's uh, Homegrown National Park Project that has just launched in the city as a project to um, involve citizens in, the, in projects that mark the line of the Garrison Creek watershed. And uh, they wanted um, local artists architects, designers, to think about ideas that were low cost, easy to implement, and uh, conser conserved water, and um, enhanced biodiversity. And so I just started riding my bike around the, within the homegrown national park boundary, and really getting inspired by the laneways. Um, I always loved being laneways, like this hidden kind of network of streets behind the, uh, the traffic on our streets. And uh, also seeing how they're built. So as opposed to roads that are graded um, to drain towards the edges, laneways are graded um, to drain to the center because there's garages and activity on the side. So the catch basins are in the center. And this is kind of a typical Toronto uh, laneway. Um, but there's lots of things happening in laneways that you start to realize. There's um, <clears throat> lots of people playing hockey, and there's lots of 
thoughts of plant life. And so I was inspired to, to take what was happening there kind of in a happenstance kind of way and um, develop a strategy for this ideas um, exhibition. Um, just looking at laneways and seeing the, the amazing diversity of plants that grow in the cracks uh, in concrete. And here's, here's my poster. Um, that was part of the exhibition, Public Laneway Puncture. And uh, so just some early ideas about what this, um, I proposed a 100 millimeter incision down the center, um, the central drainage channel of laneways. And that was my idea. It could you know, bring people together to maintain the plants in this crack. Um, it could um, filter stormwater as it flowed into the crack. Um, it wasn't about uh, affecting the existing underground infrastructure, um, but it was just about another way to allow rain to percolate into groundwater. Um, <clears throat> there's just a close up. And bring people into the space, opportunity for greening. And it caught the eye of um, a few people. Well, the host, which was um, Joe Roberts from David Suzuki's Homegrown, project, and Michelle Sanaya, who's here from the Laneway Project here in Toronto, who's, they're doing an amazing job to activate communities around the possibilities for um, the 250 kilometer network of laneways that exist here. And uh, I'll just go back to that. And, um, and also Councillor Mike Layton. So he um, really, uh, over a few years, we met with him and he galvanized lots of different departments that would help us actually make, turn this project into a reality. And uh, so I was thrilled and uh, we met with transportation, public realm, um, and we went through the list of laneways that are slated for resurfacing. So we chose laneways that were gonna be resurfaced soon and then we um, connected to those communities to make sure that they would be interested in taking on a demonstration project. And we, um, we um, have now have two laneways that have agreed to that, and so we started on drawings. And in the, in the meantime, I thought, oh, I should do this myself and see how it works. And so this is my own driveway, and, uh, and I didn't plant anything. So, you know, before and after, it really, uh, Things do happen. And so now the, the drawings have been accepted by the city and uh, we're really happy about that. And um, they're going through public tender now and hopefully these two laneway constructions will happen this summer. Um, the project's being funded through an in-kind donation from Beautiful Streets and also the hard work of our whole team and um, a grant from, from Live Green Toronto. So that's really exciting. And these are uh, the drawings and a couple of renderings from, uh, from uh, showing the, the potential of the, what's going to happen in these two laneways. And then, oh, so you can see it's no longer um, a 100 millimeter incision. It's now um, actually 800 millimeters is what the city has uh, recommended to us. And um, so it's not, you know, it's no longer this, this narrow trench. It's um, four times greater, four times more possibility for rainwater percolation. Also, it's probably a better project because cars can drive over it more easily. Um, so we propose this system of prefab unit pavers that have a 50% uh, open area, um, which doesn't really, um, I, we just imagine this kind of plant, beautiful community planting project, but here it really requires uh, seed. So then it ended up being an opportunity because we um, developed our own custom seed mix. And uh, so we studied the plants that grow in the crack and we worked with a company out of Germany, actually, to develop our crack mix. And uh, this is still in discussion. And, uh, and these are the species that um, we're, we're going to test 15 uh, species in this mix and see how, how it goes. Um, we also, of course, imagine that um, a lot of more plants will just flow in through 
through water and um, a voluntary seed dropping. Um, and then if all goes well, and we, um, we're gonna work with the communities to educate them about how to take care, um, this could actually be um, part of how our laneways are built in the future in Toronto and be part of the Green Street standards, standard guidelines for the city. So that's really, really exciting. So just to end, um, I wanted to just end with a project that uh, takes my work into the realm of public art curator and talking about landscape, um, not through my designs, but encouraging a cross-section of creative disciplines to uh, think about landscape, think about the design of our cities, and think about um, how we experience our cities. Um, and so, um, working with the Gladstone Hotel here in Toronto, um, and Christina Zeidler, the, the owner of the hotel, we um, launched Grow Up with a, a, a jury of writers and artists and landscape architects to develop a, a curatorial vision and then an open call and a show each spring at the hotel with installations in the hotel rooms. It's, it's really great, you should come by this, this April. And here's just a, a selection of some of the projects that we've, we've done over the past three years. Uh, and the audience has, has really grown and the conversations around what is possible um, through video, uh, performance, installation, you know, the hoarding on the streets, um, plants, chickens on the roof, um, through sound, what do plants sound like? Um, so it's really been an amazing experience. And uh, I passed on the curatorial um, because I wanted to start a, sh a, a project, and this is, I'll just end on this, um, where the artistic work was actually in a landscape. I wanted to test the possibility of taking the ideas of Grow Up um, out of a hotel and um, into an actual landscape. So with my partner, Galera Sadapaju, um, who has done a lot of amazing public um, art projects here in, in Toronto, um, we're launching D-Rail um, in the West Toronto Rail Path, which, um, if you don't know, it's a two and a half kilometer rail path. It's a car-free mobility network that runs alongside the UP Express and the GO train line um, in the west end of the city. And so we're really excited. We're working with the councillor and Parks and Rec and the Friends of the West Toronto Rail Path to launch this uh, this spring during Doors Open uh, Toronto with our first commissioned piece. And uh, so this is a, a snapshot of, of the website, so you can sign up there for news coming soon. And it's, it's um, also really exciting is because Doors Open Toronto is um, broadening their definition of, of what doors get to be opened. And so here, um, normally they're opening up the doors of buildings, but this here we're opening up the door of a landscape. So that's, that's really exciting. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll ask, answer any questions that you might have. Hi. Try to answer questions. <laughs> I, I promise not to ask. Um, I just wondered if any of the spontaneous blooms in your Canada bloom contribution were non-native, because you mentioned, you know, looking at resilience of why are we focusing on native. I just wondered if the, that... Non-native? Yeah, were, were any of the spontaneous blooms non-native? I'm, I'm interested in non-natives and natives um, as potential for pl plants and urban spaces. Uh, for Canada blooms, um, I picked vegetation from the fields. I mean, dormant vegetation. I didn't dig them up, but I, I put them in the rocks and the shards. And then it was funny because it was very, um, it was all like seed heads and plants that were dormant over the winter because the show takes place in March. And I didn't want to purchase any plant material because I didn't want to support the forcing of bulbs and forcing of trees. 
And then, um, but you could see there was mascari and daffodils, and so because the art direct, the show's um, art director came around, she's like, "We need a little bit more color here." Yeah. And I was like, "Gray is a color," um, but yeah, so we added those just to kind of boost up the, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we used sumac, some native grasses, um, birch trees. Uh, first, I just wanted to say um, I really enjoyed the lecture. I thought it was uh, really inspirational. And I just wondered if um, you thought that the um, the gridded system or even the trench system could possibly move out onto the busier street areas, or is there reasons why that can't happen? Or even potentially um, through some of the paved park areas, like I'm thinking like Queen's Park could maybe have something cut down the center of the pathways there? Uh, I think all streets could be built like that. Um, there, those, those. I don't think we actually need asphalt or paved surfaces at all. Um, those, those concrete uh, pavers are made to sustain vehicular traffic. Uh, so actually, all our streets could be could be built green. Maybe there's. I'm sure there's something I don't know about. Um, maybe Ted knows <laughs> um, about why we don't build our streets that way. I think it's just a matter of thinking about it differently. Um, but this, is, this will be a great test to, to test that. I mean, lots of streets have been built with unit pavers. And, uh, <clears throat> but I think to open them up to allow seed to grow too. There's lots of products too, like grass pave, where you, they're put kind of underneath uh, the surface of sod. So they're kind of the, there's a structural uh, rigid form under green, like, like maybe... Um, turnarounds for fire trucks, like places that aren't used very often, not busy streets. Um, but I don't know, I, for sure, yeah, it could be, be great. Just a continuation of that same uh, possibility, but uh, is there any uh, examples you have seen in the world having the climates like ours but not, not like this year. This year is an ex exemption. And about the traffic safety and so on, what is the, any studies done for the uh, maintaining the road safety and still have plants involved? Actually, in my view, we, we are missing quite a bit uh, uh, possibility of making greener city uh, by allowing private property owners extend their uh, usage of their front yard into the city's areas. Kind of public spaces taken away. Mm -hmm. And uh, to everybody's, like just the private owner's knowledge, limitations of their knowledge. Some mm -hmm. of them could be great, some of them could be very poor almost third world country standards. And I thought like that kind of things could be discussed with the officials and could be integrated more like a different kind of, different level of uh, green city standards. I, I agree. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just starting to look into this more, and uh, I'm joining this um, Green Streets Technical Advisory Committee, um, and they're very active. They've been, uh, there's reports and um, lots of studies done about possibilities for how we can build our roads and our school grounds and that kind of thing. I just, um, I'm just starting to get into it, but the possibility for front gardens um, is definitely there. Hi, thank you for the lecture. It was great. Um, thank you. One question that popped into my mind was uh, the the, the Green Laneways proposal that you made to the city, it proposed a fairly modest intervention. Uh, which has now grown to quite a bit, quite a bit larger green space. I wonder if you might be able to share some insight as to 
uh, what the city's thinking was in moving in that direction? Oh, the, the original proposal for the, the very narrow incision, you mean? Why we changed it to become a bigger one? Yeah. Um, well, they didn't uh, like the fact that it was just a trench, like an open trench that um, car tires could fall into, people could, you know, it was a safety thing. Um, and also it was about um, the way cars moved through it, um, people tripping in it. I mean, my argument was that it would be packed solid, full of aggregate and, and sand, and that we'd plant in it and it would become as solid a surface as as anywhere else, it wouldn't be this gully. Um, but uh, anyway, you've got to go with where the doors are opening uh, in that kind of situation. And, uh, and actually, like I said, it's actually better, uh, it's broader area for catchment. Uh, so there's more possibility for rainwater catchment. And, uh, and I love the opportunity for the sea because imagining that that could be used in all sorts of different landscapes. So all these other things, you know, at first we were resistant. I was like, there's no way um, I have to <laughs> keep it. And, you know, my team members are like, you know, Victoria, it's going to be better. And uh, so you just have to go where the doors are opening, and then the new possibilities happen. Um, so it's hopefully, now we have, to, we have to take a few years to see how it goes, to, to work with the community, to educate them. We're going to be um, doing a video and documenting it very well, so it will be a precedent, um, an educational precedent for other communities, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I have a, <coughs> a technical question regarding the use they do in this city of salt for melting the snow. What happens when the salt gets into these slots? Is going to kill the, 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 the greenery or what? Uh, well, in this kind of situation, we're using plants that are used to salt, used to cars driving over them, um, never being cared for. These plants thrive in that kind of environment. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think salt, obviously, is a concern. I don't think we salt laneways. We don't salt laneways. Um, yeah, so um, it's actually an opportunity for the plants to grow really well. Um, but they, these types of plants actually grow in conditions where salt is used. Yeah. And we'll see what, we'll study the plants that thrive and the ones that don't and then adjust the mix. Take one more question. Joe? Oh, I know this guy. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you can kind of explain further the de derail project. I was just, is it like a one-time installation of one piece, or is it the beginning of what's supposed to be a continuous, annual, like, curated event where there's an artist? Like, I'm just, if you oh, could sure. tell more about yeah, that. Yeah, sure, right. thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it's a bigger vision. It's a bigger vision to animate the, um, the rail path, which... I'll just take a moment to pitch the rail. Um, so the West Toronto Rail Path is a really active cycling pedestrian corridor, but there's really not that much going on in terms of a place to sit, a place to experience the landscape, um, a place to pause and, and think about the plants and where you are. But there are little nodes and niches kind of that set, are set um, off of the rail path. So the places where the communities come into the rail path, there's kind of these um, plazas. And so we imagine that with funding, we can um, invite artists to come, kind of like a residency, to study the landscape. So they have to be site-specific works and, uh, <clears throat> and not obstruct the movement of the path. So the path will, nev will never close down or anything. And then um, temporary ephemeral pieces, performance, poetry, anything that kind of is, stimul is um, inspired by and responds to the landscape of the rail path, which is a really unique place in the city because of the plant material that's used. It is um, the plant material that grows in a kind of um, rail corridor or roadside environment. Uh, so similar to uh, the plants that I'm interested in, um, never watered, very little maintenance, 
Um, so how can we enjoy and learn more about these types of landscapes? Derail is about that, that too. But learning about it through, uh, through the minds of artists. Uh, my question is really specific. Um, uh, when you see a lot of green roofs and stuff, you have a lot of, uh, there's a separation between the grade and the, the space above where on the top of the building. Um, in your situation, you have um, a grade which is uh, exposed to trees. And I'm just wondering, how do you maintain the growth of trees growing in these, these at-grade locations? Because like, once you kind of, if you mow it, they get even stronger and they'll grow like eight feet a year. So how do you propose that in a really informal situation that you're proposing for these laneway slots that you control that? Because in my front lawn, I get like a thousand uh, silver maple trees growing every year. So how do I, how you do you stop that You have to do your gardening, happening? sir. You have to do your weeding. Um, you have to pull them out. Um, and that's part of the education of learning what is a tree seedling. Um, how does it differ from the plants in the seed mix that we want to use? So it's, it's an education about horticulture and um, making sure that they do not take root because, like you said, they will disrupt the, um, the constructed surface of the pavers. Um, same, it happens in green roofs, it happens in the rail path, um, tree of heaven, you know, everything. Um, but yeah, it's about learning what stays in and what you have to pull out. It's easy. I can show you. <laughs> well, thanks so much. Uh